right, looks like we are right at noon. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us for our final Butcher Block talk in our webinar series. Um, today we are joined by Nick Fickbaum from the South Dakota Enterprise Institute, which provides um, consulting through the South Dakota Small Business Development Center. So how today is going to work, uh, Nick indicated that he likes kind of the back and forth questions during uh, his presentation. So feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A or the chat um, and we'll kind of take care of those as we get them. Um, and then uh, I'll talk about this at the end again, but um, since this is our final program in this series, uh, you should be receiving an email from me at the after this is done um, with a brief survey of um, the webinars so we can kind of get a little bit of your feedback from you. So please take the time to um, to do that um, so I can kind of have a better idea of how to serve you better. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nick and we appreciate him taking the time to speak with us today. Definitely. Thanks, Christina. I appreciate uh, being a part of this program today. Um, so like Christina said, my name is Nick. I, uh, I work at the South Dakota Enterprise Institute. Our, uh, our main office is located uh, out at the research park. For those of you in the Brookings area or that are that pass through every once in a while, we're in this uh, fancy looking building just to the east of campus. Um, we, uh, we work across the state of South Dakota doing lots of different things. My main responsibilities uh, entail working in Brookings County as the South Dakota Small Business Development Center counselor. For those that aren't familiar with what the SBDC is, it's a, it's a professional, confidential, no cost business consulting service to individuals starting a business or improving their exist, existing business. So. Generally for me, when I'm meeting with clients, it's everything from talking with somebody who maybe needs help just getting a sales tax license, understanding what it looks like to start an actual LLC or a corporation, uh, all the way through somebody who is maybe buying an existing business, selling a business that they, that they started, or they might have a business that's successful and has been growing and they're looking at opening up a second location, or they're looking at offering different products, services, things of that nature. We really work with, with most anybody that, uh, that has a, a business or an idea for a business. Um, and this is something that's available across the state of South Dakota. Um, one of the things that we are probably best known for, uh, which ties in perfectly today, is we're probably best known for helping our clients prepare to go to a bank to, to get a loan or to get financing, financing of some kind. And that generally is going to involve writing a business plan as well as providing financial projections or developing financial projections for our clients. As I mentioned, this is a service that's available across the state of South Dakota, and it's actually a national service as well. It's, uh, we're a, a resource partner of the Small Business Administration. They help fund uh, our, our program, and we're essentially an extension of them to be able to help small business owners. As you can see here, just kind of a quick breakdown of the six regions across South Dakota. Um, if you happen to be located somewhere else and you are interested in the services from the SBDC in your area, I'm more than happy to connect you with who that individual is in the area if you're not already working with them. Uh, this is one of the great things though that I, that I really think is, is an amazing value with the SBDC is that we're available anywhere in South Dakota especially for a state like ours that's, that's fairly spread out and, and somewhat rural in some areas, there's always something that's available for your county or your region. And we're always going to be free and we're always going to be confidential. So uh, if you have any questions about utilizing the SBDC, I'm more than happy to help with that, whether it's in Brookings County or anywhere else in the state. Before I go any further uh, with talking about how to write a business plan before we dive into kind of our, our main topic today, uh, one of the things I wanted to touch on was this great resource that we give to all of our clients, which provides lots of value when it comes to writing a business plan. And on our website, which is sdbusinesshelp.com, you can find contact information for all of the different counselors across the state. Um, you can also find the uh, information for the, for the different uh, resource partners that are available. But under the resources tab, you'll, you'll be able to find this business planning guide. 
And if you meet with an actual client or if you meet with um, an actual counselor, it'll look just like this. But uh, this is an amazing tool, I think, for anybody that's in business. And specifically, if you're writing a business plan, there is a section in there that has about seven or eight pages on writing a business plan. Uh, what I personally like about it the most is the fact that that section of the, the business planning guide where it helps you write a business plan is truly just a list of questions and the answers to those questions end up becoming your business plan. So taking something that's very unique or something that's maybe brand new to us and being able to simplify it down into just answering some questions is, is a really great way to make this process go from being maybe confusing and new to kind of straightforward and simple. Slides, there we go. So uh, one of the things that always comes into play when writing a business plan, or one of the things I often talk to clients about is the reason why they're writing a business plan. 99% of the time they're writing it because they're preparing to go to a lender or they're preparing for some type of financing. Uh, sometimes there are cases where, uh, where someone likes to have a business plan in place just purely as a way to have some structure and to be able to have a guide for what they're working on and making sure that they're, that they're hitting their goals. But more often than not, it has to do with, with preparing for financing or something along those lines. So in, in my time working with lenders frequently uh, as, as kind of a connecting point with our clients, these are kind of some of the main things that I always uh, see as deciding factors. And it's something to keep in mind when you're writing a business plan. First and foremost, while a bank loan or a lender is always going to be providing funding for your business and what that business looks like, also keep in mind that at the end of the day, they're actually making that investment in, as you and a person or a group of people. They want to know that you're somebody that either has experience, some unique specializations, degree pro, degrees from the past, things of that nature that are going to allow you to be successful in running this business. Uh, the, the example that I always give when, uh, when working with um, clients or when talking to, to SDSU classes or, or other colleges in the state is if, if I've never uh, built a surfboard before and I want to start a surfboard company, it's going to be pretty hard to prove that I have the ability to do that if it's something that's brand new to me. Uh, so it's just something to keep in mind that being able to validate why you can run that business successfully is very important when considering financing or lending. Second of all, what is the collateral of the business? Um, you know, this has different factors that come into play between does that individual have the ability to put down a down payment or do they have other things that are going to be tangible assets that the business will be able to utilize in the event that there is need for liquidation or just for the, for the, the uh, reassurance for the lender that what they're getting into is, is a safe and smart business decision. Uh, at, the, at the end of the day, uh, lenders, banks are in the business of lending money and helping, but they're also in the business of minimizing risk. So when we are looking at financing, things of that nature, if we're taking off that money for usable goods that, that, that can be resold or that have an actual tangible value for the long term, that makes a big difference. Lastly, it's always important to think about the business or the industry that you're entering. Are there lots of regulations? Are, is there a lot of red tape that's gonna make it a very slow, arduous process to get the business up and running? And how does that impact your ability to keep the business moving forward? Is the industry that you're entering into growing or is it stagnant? Um, of course, that's gonna have a big impact on your projections and how you're gonna be able to actually run the business going forward. So just some things to keep in mind that should be highlighted in the business plan and, and more importantly, discussed or, or, or top of mind when working with a lender or a financial institution. So getting into the kind of the nuts and bolts of writing a business plan, um, the points on this slide are kind of some of the main things that I talk with with nearly every client that I work with when it comes to writing a business plan. The first one there, sometimes people kind of look at me funny when I say this, but I really truly believe it is that 90% of a business plan is already in your head. It's just as simple as being able to put those words and ideas onto paper and organizing them from there. Just like when we start a business or when we're doing something that's brand new to us, there's no guiding light of what the exact uh, way to do something is. 
Uh, when I when I talk to SDSU classes, one of the things I do oftentimes is I'll I'll go to Google and I'll just search how to how to start a business. And there's literally nine billion search results that come up for how to start a business. Uh, and I use this just as a way to kind of prove that there's no one specific way to do it. And it's just the same with the business plan. There's not always going to be one specific way to do it. And it's, it's a brand new thing for us without one specific answer. So keeping in mind that most of the answers are in your head. It's just a matter of putting them in, into, into uh, ideas and sentences and going forward from there. The third point I have listed there is also very important. And something that gets skipped over, in my opinion, quite often, and that's writing a business plan from a best case scenario. So we want to make sure that when we're writing a business plan, it's written from the standpoint of everything goes perfect. We hit an absolute home run and everything that we set out to do is achieved. Uh, words like if shouldn't be included in business plans. At the end of the day, a business plan, of course, is a plan. So it's, this, is, this is what I'm going to do. This is who I am. This is how I'm going to do it. And this will be the end result. And, and certainly we know as, as people that that will change over time and that things can, can change or adjust or pivot. But we want to make sure that we're writing this from the best case scenario and that we're shining a positive light on the process as opposed to maybe talking about things as though they may or may not happen. That's, that speaks more to, to doubt or to the fact that this isn't something that you feel confidently about. So just making sure that we talk about when this gets done, this will happen, as opposed to if I can get this done, then this might, may or may not happen. Next, just like anything else, we want to try to keep this as simple as possible. Short, detailed sentences make a world of difference. Um, one of the things that I see most frequently with that is when somebody is describing themselves or they're describing uh, maybe the organizational team or the management team for their business. There doesn't need to be five or six sentences about what that, what that person's responsibilities were, are going to be. It can simply be bullet points. It can be what their degree is, what their certifications are. But keeping things simple is going to allow you to, to write a business plan much quicker. That next one uh, bullet point there, you know, something that we've kind of you know, heard from when we were all young is just sticking to those five core things. You know, the, the who, what, when, where, and why of your business. You know, the who is, who's going to be running the business? The what, you know, what are you selling? What's your product or service? The when, you know, when is your timeline to entering the market? Or when are you going to be expanding what you're currently doing? The where, where are you physically going to be located? And where are you going to be selling your goods or products? And the why, the why being, are you solving a problem? Are you saving somebody time? Or is this something else that you currently, that you already are, are doing? Next. Another thing that we want to do to make sure that we keep things simple is using round numbers and educated guesses when it makes sense. Uh, one of the things that I see sometimes with clients is they're trying to figure out if they're going to need eight employees to start their business or if they're going to need nine employees to start their business. Uh, when they're writing a business plan, those two numbers, you know, that, that difference of one person doesn't make that big of a difference. So Making things easy in the beginning is going to allow you to move forward. And then from there, you can refine things and make adjustments. Uh, a, a great example of that is working on financial projections. Um, somebody is trying to figure out how many, how many goods or how many, of their, you know, how many widgets they're going to sell that they're making or what they're going to sell it for. Sticking to one set easy round number as you get started will help you move forward. And then from there, you can figure things out. The next one, uh, five to seven pages is, is perfect for a business plan. Oftentimes when talking with somebody, they think of a business plan as like 15 to 20 pages. It's got to be really technical. There's got to be you know, lots of detailed information and it has to be really, really long because it's super important. In my opinion, a good business plan can be condensed into five or seven pages. Now, having said that, there can be scenarios where you may have technical writing, uh, engineering drawings, things of that nature that get added onto a business plan. But the, the five kind of main subjects that we're talking about today, that can be fit into five to seven pages maximum and tell the story and convey what you're doing. The last one there, I think, is, is probably another one that has a lot of value that gets overlooked very often. Um, and that's charts, graphs, and tables are always going to be your friend when writing a business plan. 
one of the things that I often talk about with clients when, when I talk about this is that we want to think about writing a business plan from the perspective of who's reading it. And one of the things that comes to mind for me with this is how people learn and how they understand things. Um, you know, oftentimes it's a lot easier to look at a picture or to look at a graph of something to understand what the message is, as opposed to reading several paragraphs. Uh, we, uh, at our office here, we're, we're part of a coalition that puts on a business plan competition uh, up at SDSU every year. That's a lot of fun. And oftentimes that first copy of a business plan will get from a student. They have paragraph after paragraph about their sales. And it says, in year one, I will do a million dollars in sales and I'll make this much profit. And it'll be based off this many units sold. And then they just keep on going down the line. And the next thing you know, it's three paragraphs explaining what their sales are. Taking all that information and just easily converting it into a, an easy to read graph of their sales are starting here and they're slowly moving upwards, or maybe there's some diversion, things like that, is a very easy way to read and also save yourself some time when putting together a business plan. Another uh, example that I see fairly often with this that, in my opinion, can save a lot of time and is very easy to use is when we're talking about our competition and how we set ourselves apart and what are maybe our competitive advantages. Uh, so often, again, I'll see situations where somebody takes an entire page of their business plan to write out, this is competitor number one, here's what they do, here's what they do better than us, here's what they maybe are lacking at. Taking information like that and converting it into an easy table where you just have your competitors listed in one column, the pros of their business in another column, and the cons of their business in another column. That's an easy example of taking lots of information and condensing it down into an easy to read, easy to understand table, as opposed to worrying about writing out several paragraphs yourself. So always keep in mind that there are, there are really easy ways to make a business plan a lot simpler on yourself. And always keep in mind too, that we wanna make sure that we're writing it from the perspective of the person that's gonna be reading it. Another example of that to, to mention is making sure that we're avoiding technical terms or slang or lingo that might be something that's specific to your industry or your job. Uh, that's something I see lots of times working with, with engineers is they're using terminology that is really only utilized by engineers. And so if they're presenting this to a lender or if they're presenting this to their accountant, to a lawyer, they might not understand what they're trying to say. So thinking about who's reading the business plan when we write it is another valuable lesson to keep in mind that'll, that'll make things a lot easier on yourself. So getting into kind of the, the core of what every business plan includes is going to be these five uh, bullets that are listed here. One of the things that, uh, that I think is also important to point out uh, <clears throat> is that with, with business plans, you're going to see a fair amount of redundancy. You know, that, that it's going to happen sometimes where there'll be crossover and that's perfectly normal. Um, it, it, it's all tied in together, but just be aware that that's going to happen somewhat often. So first and foremost, um, describing the company. In this section of the business plan, we want to make sure that we're discussing who and what our target market is. Depending on the type of industry that you're entering, sometimes uh, I've seen clients even utilize what their specific perfect customer is. So looking at the gender, their uh, maybe their age range, maybe where they live, how they purchase things, having an understanding of exactly what your target market is, is very important to one, show that, you're, that you know what you're doing, but two, it's also important to, to have a better idea of how you're gonna be able to sell to that market, and also more importantly, how big that market is. Um, back, to, back to my surfboard example from previously that, that I like to use. If I'm trying to sell surfboards in January in South Dakota, my target market is pretty small. Um, it's probably zero. And so for, for that reason, it's pretty hard to look at that and, and actually try to convince myself that my business is viable. So keeping in mind how big our target market is is, is very important. Next, we want to be able to talk about how we will enter into the market and what that will look like for our business. Um, are we going to be a business to business seller? You know, are we making a good that we sell to another business? 
that ultimately ends up in the hands of the actual customer at the end of the day. Are we selling directly to the customer ourselves or is it a combination of, of both? That's, that happens quite often. Another thing that's also important to keep in mind is how you'll sell your good. Is it strictly retail? Is it through a brick and mortar store? Is it online? Is it in just South Dakota or a specific part of South Dakota? Is it international? Um, you know, these things are gonna impact, of course, first off your, your target market, but also your ability to sell and how quickly you can sell. And of course, uh, if I run uh, Nick's Hamburger Shop on Main Street in Brookings, I've only got so many people that I can sell to on a daily basis. Whereas, uh, you know, if I'm uh, Falcon Plastic and I'm selling things uh, internationally, certainly my, my market is much bigger. So being aware of what that looks like and how it impacts your, your business today and your business your business's ability to grow long-term is very important. Next, we wanna look at the location of the business and if there's any advantages or disadvantages of, of having your business there. Um, this could be being closer to, to your, your end consumer. This could be uh, involving being closer to goods and services that you need to run your business but simply just being aware of the advantages that your business has based off their location. Next up, we wanna make sure that we're addressing our competition and any strengths or weaknesses that they have. In my opinion, this is one section that's important to touch on regardless of the type of competition that you have. Um, even if there is a very large uh, person, a very large business in, in your market or your industry that has enormous market share and they have owned the market for several years, it's important, important to acknowledge what they do and what they're good at, but also maybe where they're lacking and how that allows you to have a competitive advantage against them. Simply just not mentioning your competition at all is a sign of maybe not being prepared or not having an understanding of the type of market that you're entering into. So even if your, your uh, market or your competition is very competitive, it's important to make to make sure that you're acknowledging it and that you're aware of it. Next up, when we're talking more specifically about our product and our markets, we want to make sure that we're discussing again what our total addressable market is. So how big it is locally, and then maybe what it looks like outside of the area if that's if that, if that's how the business is run, and then of course where and how you will sell. Uh, these, of course, are, are, are very important because it's going to speak to where the business is today and how you're going to be able to grow the business in the long term. You know, anytime uh, I work with somebody when we're putting together financial projections, it's always a unique situation because there may not be one specific way to determine the actual abilities for the business to grow, but having an idea of what that'll look like and how you get there is very important. So. If that means hiring more salesmen and women or selling online versus just brick and mortar, things like that are important to include to talk about how your business will grow in the long term. Next up, making sure that you're stating your advantage. Is your product unique in some way or is it protectable? You know, we, uh, we see sometimes with uh, intellectual property, with patent rights, trademarks, things like that. If your business has something along those lines, or if you've developed a new technique or a new process that allows your business to be more competitive or more efficient than, than your competition, that can be a huge advantage, which can allow your business to grow and be even more successful in the long term. So making sure that we're aware of that and that we're highlighting what makes this business great is important when you're, when you're filling out the section of the business plan involving your product and the markets that it's entering into. Also, we want to make sure again that we're talking about our competitors, but also any excuse me, any licenses or certifications that are required for this type of business. Um, again, if this is a business that has lots of red tape, it requires lots of thumbs up from uh, maybe the people in peer or maybe people in DC, things like that. That is something that is good to be aware of and speaking to how it'll impact your timeline in a good or a bad way in the long run. Next up, again, uh, you know, back to the beginning when we talked about um, the, the fact that a lender or, or someone that's providing financing is investing in yourself or investing in a team, we want to make sure that we're highlighting as much as possible the individuals in the organization and also what their responsibilities are going to be. One of the things uh, that I see quite often is 
um, you know, someone who's starting a business or a, you know, some friends that are starting a business, a group of people that are, are very good at what they do, but they haven't actually sat down and thought about what their responsibilities are going to be. And, you know, a, a great example with, with SDSU close by is, is working with um, egg science students or with engineering students where they all have similar backgrounds in their schooling, but as they start a business, they need to look at which one of them is going to be the accountant, uh, which one of them is going to be the salesman, which one of them is going to handle the, the day-to-day orders and things like that. So making sure that you're able to spell out the staff that you have and their responsibilities is important. Just the same, because we want to make sure that we're writing a business plan from a big picture perspective, and again, we want to make sure we're writing it from a best case scenario, this also can, can mean that we want to make sure that we're talking about additional staff or new responsibilities that will come up as the business grows. You know, if we're writing a business plan for, for an expansion or if we're adding a second location, how many staff members are we going to need to staff that new location? Are there going to be any more responsibilities for having two locations versus one? And what does that look like for the business? And are you able to locate a key employee who's going to be able to do that successfully? Things like that are very important to be able to show that the business is set up in a way that it can be successful in the long run. Probably the hardest part, in my opinion, or, or sometimes the, the, the trickiest parts to figure out of a business plan is putting together your financial assumptions and, and your financial projections. When we're, when we're doing this, um, you know, I, have on, I have on the side of the screen there just kind of an easy breakdown of some assumptions. Um, it's always important to try to keep things as simple as possible. Um, oftentimes, like I have listed out here, it's just simply figuring out what you're going to sell something for, how many of it you have, what it costs you to produce, and then from there figuring out what your, uh, what your profit margin is going to be. Also, it's important as you're getting started to have an understanding of what your actual startup costs are going to be. And I think that's uh, one of the biggest things that I see working with clients is having an understanding of all the little things that go into starting a business or, or you know, building a building, things like that. It, it always kind of uh, surprises me when people maybe don't think about the fact that you know, they have to have insurance or they have to have um, you know, workman's comp, things like that uh, as they move forward. There's brand new things for somebody, but it's important to be aware of what those things are as you're getting started. And within that, you know, I think to, to kind of uh, toot the horn of the SBDC, you know, I think there's two ways that we provide a lot of value for, for clients uh, and for small businesses across the state. Uh, first and foremost, you know, when, when someone's creating financial assumptions and when they're writing their business plan, one of the things that they often come across that can be difficult is finding information and finding data that they know is reliable and that they know is factual and concrete. So one of the things that, that the SBDC provides across the entire state, um, and our, our team here at the Enterprise Institute actually does the research for them, is we provide industry data research reports for any small businesses or large businesses across the state of South Dakota. Um, there are a handful of resources that we pay for, uh, large database websites that have information reports on any industry in the country. Uh, and we're able to go out and find national information on the annual revenue for coffee shops or for a construction company. Um, we can also find that similar information in the state of South Dakota. Uh, sometimes if it's a big enough industry, we can find it for specific parts of South Dakota, uh, whether that be East River, West River, um, specific towns sometimes as well. But that can be uh, a huge advantage for somebody when they're writing a business plan, because certainly we want to make sure that as we're writing it and we're putting in these financial assumptions, that we have a good understanding of what we're including for information and that it's factual. And of course, more importantly, that it's actually viable and it's something that you can do. So if this is something that maybe you're struggling with with, with your financial assumptions or you're just looking for some, for some uh, reassurance, it is one of the things that we provide across the state. Uh, but I think one of, the, uh, one of the reports that we use locally, I think that has the most value, actually breaks down average revenue, 
average cost of goods sold, average payroll costs. So this information can really be a, a big savior as far as making sure that the information that you have is, is accurate to where we are located. Within those reports as well, I should also mention, when you're looking at things like figuring out how big your target market is and how big your, your addressable market is outside of the area or where are you plan on selling at, that information is also included as well. So there are lots of different ways that we can help out in that capacity. Um, and then within that as well, when, when you're actually putting together your financial assumptions, you know, one of the things I think that we find the most is that if it's not something that, that someone has done in the past or if they're not comfortable with, it might not be something that they, that they excel at. So as I said at the beginning, we do provide financial projections for our clients as they're preparing to go to the lender. Um, and these are three-year projections that can break out a cash flow analysis, an income statement, and a, and a balance sheet to have an understanding of if the business is moving forward, where you currently plan it to be at, if it's able to bring in enough profits to, to continue to move forward and to keep the lights on. So uh, if that's something that is part of your business plan that you are maybe struggling with or that you have questions on, that is something that we're more than happy to help with. Uh, I have lots of clients that I work with who like to come in and just have projections made every six to 10 months, just to have an understanding and an idea of what they're doing moving forward. Um, sometimes we also have clients that'll come in and say, hey, Nick, I'm, I'm looking at opening up a second location but I wanna make sure that it makes financial sense or I wanna have a good understanding of what it'll actually cost to get going. So that's a, an easy conversation to sit down, kind of plug in some numbers and get a, get a good idea of what the break-even analysis is gonna be on that and what the profitability will be of having two locations or, or more than that. So in recap, um, just kind of covering what we discussed today, we always wanna make sure that we're including uh, product and service of where we'll offer it and what our com competitive advantage is. We wanna make sure that we are discussing who our target market is, our timeline to entry. Uh, and I think that that's a, a bullet point to keep in mind in that with a business plan, we're always writing it from the standpoint of where we are now and where we're going. And that timeline can be whatever it looks like for yourself. It's just a matter of explaining how you'll get there and the steps that are that are needing to be taken between now and then to get there. So the, the great thing about a, a business plan, you know, is that there are lots of unknowns, but at the same time, it is something that will allow people to, to tell their version of what's going to happen and why. And as long as you're able to provide information that can be viable, that is going to allow you to, to write a, an easier business plan once you're able to explain the who, what, when, where, and why. Uh, and then lastly, just making sure again that we kind of define our management team and their experience and then putting together our critical assumptions of keeping it simple to figure out what is it going to cost financially to get the business started and what do we think we can sell our product for and what does that leave us at the end of the month uh, for profits to pay our bills. So um, there's my contact information at the bottom, um, just kind of in, in the spirit of kind of having a conversation or maybe Seeing if there's anything specific, um, I just listed out some questions there for uh, anyone in attendance that maybe had some trouble or some pain points in the past writing a business plan, or maybe uh, anything that, that was helpful from today. So with that, uh, open it up to questions if there are any. Um, thanks for your time, everyone. Awesome. Thank you very much, Nick. So yeah. if uh, anybody has any questions, they can either raise their hand, drop it in the chat, put it in the Q&A, um, and we can get the conversation started. Um, maybe while we're waiting, I can throw in my first question that we've that I've got here. Um, on your bullet point about keeping your business plan simple, and you use the example of the eight versus nine employees, is it better to overestimate what you may need or what's the way to go about that? That's, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. So um, it's, always, it's always gonna be in your best interest to have a conservative mindset when you're writing a business plan. So if you're stuck between eight and nine, going with nine is gonna be your, your best option. Um, 
on the financial projection side, if you think that you can sell 100 units a month, but that might be on the high end, it might be best to, to lower that to 90, you know, whatever that looks like. But yeah, always kind of taking a conservative approach um, is important because, you know, again, back to, um, back to kind of the purpose of a business plan, if we're writing this from a, a standpoint of going to a bank or to, to getting a loan, things like that, if we, if we know that we have some aggressive estimates that we, that we think we can hit, if we write that from a more conservative standpoint, that just leaves kind of that much more room that allows us to have some, some adjustments. Great, makes sense. Anybody out in Zoom land have a question? Then I can uh, I can ask another one. Then <laughs> it's very good information. I learned a lot. Thanks. So, um, so and your point about who the competition is, is there a danger of overstating their strengths to hurt yourself or not? I think I mean I think there certainly could can be in some capacities. Um, I, I think it, it it comes down to to discussing maybe what they're doing and, and what what makes it great but then also how you're competing um you know so if we're if we're talking about cell phones and, and we bring up the fact that you know apple has large market share and they're very good at it but then discussing how you're able to, to counteract that um uh, i think one of the one of the things that, that i've discussed with clients before is that you know if they have a small business and they have a really big competitor they might be able to provide much better customer service because of the fact that they have fewer customers at that time and they're able to have more contact with them. So, um, yeah, I mean, there, there, there certainly can be some, some area there where you may be doing a little bit of a disservice, but I think at the end of the day, it's more important just to make sure that you address who they are and how you're able to either keep up with them or, or, or overtake them. Great. Well, it looks like you just, you know, answered everybody's questions here and <laughs> you covered it all. I hate it when that happens. All right. Well, um, I guess once uh, once this webinar closes out here, um, if you need Nick's information, it was on the last slide, um, or you can reach out to me and I can get you connected. Um, and this webinar will again um, be posted up on YouTube like the other ones have been. So we'll try to get that link sent out as soon as it's up. Looks like Nick dropped his um, information in the chat too, if anybody wants it right now. Um, so then just kind of housekeeping to wrap up the session um, or the webinar itself. Um, just remember, if you are planning on applying for the South Dakota Coronavirus Relief Fund Meat Processing Capacity Grant, those are due on May 1st, um, so make sure that you get that in if you're planning on it. Um, and the link to um, the resources that Nick spoke about at the beginning, I put that in the chat as well, so if you um, want to take a look at that, that's where you can get to um, the document that he was referencing. Um, and again, uh, I'll be sending out an email with a link to a survey for the, the webinar series. So I'd appreciate if um, all of you could take five minutes or so and get, uh, get me a little bit of feedback so we can serve you better in the future. Um, with that, again, I would like to thank Nick for his time today, um, and thank you to Matt for sticking with us through all of the all of the webinars that we've had here, and a special and especially thanks to all of you for tuning in. So, um, thanks, and that'll conclude our webinar series.